It is a delight uh, for me uh, to um, introduce and welcome and introduce uh, William Donahue, Professor Donahue uh, from Notre Dame. He is the uh, John Cavanaugh Professor of the Humanities and the director of the Nanovich Institute for European Studies there. Um, I say it is a particular delight because uh, tonight's event, for you it's not night though, William, but uh, here we are. We see you in snow, almost surrounded by snow, but um, anyway. Um, it is a, a delight because this uh, event tonight is um, also uh, supported by the Dresden Trust. The Dresden Trust is a rather unique institution in this country who has done uh, a great deal uh, for um, the reconciliation and friendship with the people of uh, Dresden. And um, it is um, a particular privilege that we have you here, um, Professor Donahue, to um, speak on the subject of Dresden, a matter of conscience in many respects. And of course, um, the 13th of February has just passed, um, a problematic date in our calendar, but an important one for this particular lecture. Um, Professor Donahue is um, an expert in German Jewish studies and a wide range, in fact, also Germany and the European Union. He has um, published on contemporary German literature, film, in film and on TV. He uh, is also known for um, a major study on um, Elias Canetti, the auto da fe, uh, which is titled, um, interestingly, The End of Modernism. And um, there's another major study of his, which I would like to mention in this context here. Um, it is Holocaust as Fiction. This is, was a study on uh, Bernhard Schlink's so-called Nazi novels and their films. Um, I dare say that um, the topic uh, is controversial enough, um, but um, I would also like to point out that um, Bill Donahue has uh, written a very significant, very important article on the subject in the German periodical Merkur, and in fact, uh, that triggered my particular interest to have you as one of our BASF uh, lecturers here in the Center of Anglo-German Cultural Relations. Um, just one technical uh, point. Um, the talk will be for about uh, 40 minutes or so. And uh, then we will have um, a Q&A through the chat. Uh, Richelle Whitehead has kindly agreed to monitor this together with me, so we will read out questions uh, via the chat. If you would like to be um, promoted to co-host and you want to speak, uh, then this can be done through uh, Richelle. So with all of that, over to you, Will. It's a delight to have you with us, and um, we are looking forward to your talk immensely. Thank you, uh, Rudiga, and, and thank you so much for the invitation. I'm going to take just a second here to share my screen and see if I can do it without messing things up too much. Uh, there we go. And Rochelle, you let me know if that is working on your end, if you all can see it. Shall I take that as an affirmative? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, well, once again, uh, thank you so much, uh, Rudiga. <clears throat> I want to, uh, first of all, confess uh, to a sin that many academics commit, and that is I've changed my title at the last minute, but not substantially. Uh, I, what I've done is simply borrowed what I think is a lovely quote from the book that I want to talk about, Vermutlich die Wirklichkeit selbst, uh, and then added a subtitle uh, that might look rather mundane called Remembering Dresden via Literature and Film. Uh, you'll notice that I've dropped Hamburg a bit uh, from the title, but it's something I've thought about and care about. And if it's on the minds of any participants, I'd love to talk about it in the Q&A. I just didn't find a way to give it proper attention within the bounds of the talk. So <clears throat> as Rudiger mentioned, the genealogy of the talk is uh, an article that I wrote for Merkur, uh, 
Um, and just to give the auditors a roadmap, what I'd like to do uh, here today is recapitulate and refine some of that argument, not all of it, and then see if I can extend it uh, to film and particularly to uh, the work of Michael Klier, who produced a trilogy, uh, a Dresden trilogy. Uh, given the time constraints, I'll pay attention to just two of those films and in one really only in, in depth, but I'm hoping to be able to extend the analysis to film in, in that way. Uh, and by way of framing the argument, another thing to say maybe at the outset, um, and this might refine the subtitle of my talk, um, what most interests me uh, is not only the what of literary evidence, the stuff of it, if you will, the content, uh, but also uh, the why and the how. And by that, I mean the way in which literature serves uh, as a vehicle or can serve as a vehicle to reflect on why and how we turn to the past in the first place, particularly to dark pasts and difficult ones like the bombing of Dresden. I'll have more to say about that uh, in just a moment, uh, but just to tip you off, uh, as maybe any good teacher would do to give you the thesis in advance, uh, a lot of it, uh, the argument will have to do uh, with what Hanushek does in his small book that I'll be addressing in just a moment. And that is, he sheds the authority, the academic authority uh, that he might otherwise have and takes on the role of a fictional narrator. Uh, uh, what that actually means, uh, we'll discover um, in, in the rest of the talk, but I wanted to put that out there at, at the beginning. So the book in question is this uh, little uh, book uh, it is by any account, I suppose you could say a Nebenarbeit, a kind of a byproduct of other work that Sven Hanoschek uh, has done. Hanoschek is known to Germanists um, as a, a Germanist himself and a writer of really important biographies. Uh, the one I'm most familiar with is the 800 page uh, biography of Elias Canetti, which is the gold standard. Um, but in, with respect to this small book, <clears throat> he worked for years in the Kessner archive uh, just uh, in 2013, uh, brought out a new edition of uh, Der Gang vor die Hunde, uh, and uh, before that, uh, wrote what many consider to be the definitive uh, biography of Kessner himself called Keine Blichter hinter das Gesicht, das Leben Erich Kessners. Why do I mention all that? Well, for one, I think it does actually establish his authority as a Kessner expert. Um, and I think it whets our appetite for why this little book, um, you know, if one could imagine uh, in, in one respect, he had interesting scraps left over from those other projects and simply had to make something of them, felt compelled to do it. Uh, this is not just small talk or, or idle speculation, I think, because what motivates us and him to turn to the past is really gonna be a major theme of this talk and becoming conscious of that and how literature and film can make us conscious of those mo motives and those framing devices, which in turn uh, can determine what we see and, and how we see. So um, with that, I think I would like to actually turn to the text here on the back cover, uh, because for those not familiar with it, I think it does offer us an entryway uh, into the book. Uh, Im Februar 1945 fliegen amerikanische und britische Bomber Richtung Dresden. Verzweifelt schreibt die Dresdnerin Ida Kästner Postkarten und Briefe an ihren Sohn Erich in Berlin. Nur wenige Straßenzüge weiter sitzt ein junger amerikanischer Soldat in einem Keller in Kriegsgefangenschaft, Kurt Vonnegut, der später mit Schlachthof 5 einen der größten Kriegsromane schreiben wird. Gemeinsam erleben sie den Feuersturm. Was ging dabei in ihren Herzen und Köpfen vor? Well, apart from that last uh, sentence, uh, which is really more for marketing, uh, I think the previous uh, lines do give us a fair sense of what this is about. Uh, and then the, the following ones in Burgundy as well, one sees uh, that the, the task, the agenda here is to in some way combine uh, historical document with literature and to, to see what, what, what can, can come out of that. Um, so as I've said uh, in my opening remarks, uh, I want to consider uh, not only the what, but the how and the why uh, we remember Dresden. <clears throat> and to do that, I think maybe it makes sense to step back just for a few moments to look at these two models of uh, the relationship of literature and history. The first one I, I think is rather common and, and widely understood, probably won't take too much time to set out. And that is literature as a cultural archive, a reservoir, if you will, of stories uh, 
uh, meant to preserve history, to fund uh, a national and cultural identity. Uh, when I, uh, I used to teach at Duke and I remember Salman Rushdie uh, gave a very memorable talk. He stood up on the stage and said, you know, first and foremost, literature is charged with bringing home the news, those crucial stories that constitute a culture and a people's identity. Uh, in the German context, I think Wege Sebald is known uh, for this conception of literature as well. Not, I would point out, in the way he writes, but in the, the manifesto uh, that goes under the title Literatur und Luftkrieg, where he bemoans uh, famously and perhaps infamously the alleged lack of literary output by German authors that, uh, strictly speaking, addresses the Allied bombings. Uh, this summary by uh, a Zebald scholar by the name of Susanna V. Scolani, I think is very accurate about the, uh, the, the essay. She says, according to Zebald, it is essential for post-war German authors to record history and to act as public witnesses, as it is the function of literature to keep historical events from being erased by memory. Now, if we were to apply that to Zebald's literary output, we could say, you know, not fair, but uh, if as a summary of this argument he's making, problematic argument uh, that he's making there that launched so many discussions that perhaps we don't even need to go into. As a summary, I think it, it is accurate. Um, the idea that literature um, is somehow this storehouse uh, that can provide the necessary uh, basis for, for keeping uh, a history alive and, and, and not concealed. <clears throat> now, one only needs to consider a moment, uh, a few books that I've given here as examples to see how problematic this is. What I've thrown out and won't discuss in any detail are, are two very different novels, one by Toni Morrison, Beloved from 1987, and the other famous or infamous novel and then movie by Margaret Mitchell, Gone with the Wind, both take uh, the American South, uh, uh, the period of slavery and, and the, right after the Civil War is their time of action and treat it radically differently. So uh, I only put that on there just to briefly complicate the idea that literature can unproblematically or straightforwardly fund uh, uh, our notions of uh, national identity. Of course, literature can also cite history to then conceal it. It can cite it and then act in, in other ways that is maybe problematic or uh, Avdorna would have said is affirmative of, of dominant culture. Um, but anyway, let's just leave that alone for now um, and then look at the second uh, relationship of literature to the second model of the relationship of literature and history. And that is uh, the one I've listed on this slide, literature as a meditation on acknowledging and framing the past. Um, and the two questions really that I, I want to focus on what makes us care in the first place and what keeps us from engaging the past. One could add other questions, you know, uh, but the idea here is that literature is not only concerned with the what, but also the motivation to break out of the present or to let the past break into the present. Um, now, as I, I don't want to play one conception off the other uh, or to the detriment of the other or denigrate either, I think both are present in the book that I now want to return to, which is Hanushek's little book called Wir leben noch. Wir leben noch uh, is a, a title uh, taken from some of those documents he found in the archive from the postcards and letters that Eric Kessner's mother wrote to Eric, uh, who was in Berlin under the Gestapo uh, observation, increasing observation. Uh, she writes to let him know that they survived the bombing, she and, her fa uh, and his father, um, and that they love him and they miss him, uh, but precious little else. Um, the, the, that's the, uh, the, the t where the, the title uh, comes from. But as we begin uh, this book, it looks uh, like we're very much in that first model, that first paradigm of literature and history, where we're simply looking uh, at documents and literature as a way of remembering the past of not letting it be forgotten without thinking about any of those other uh, issues that I raised. Um, and we have uh, at the outset in the first couple of pages, a number of sources. <clears throat> the title itself suggests that they're gonna be two key informants, Ida Kessner, Eric's uh, mother and, and Kurt Vonnegut, uh, to whom we'll turn in just a moment. Vonnegut for, probably doesn't need to be introduced, but you know, at the time he was a young POW uh, and he witnesses the bombing uh, and participates uh, in the cleanup of the corpses. 
and then uh, writes about it after the war. He says uh, in his memoirs that he writes and writes and writes, but he couldn't publish the novel for decades later because he couldn't find a way uh, to, to capture uh, what he had experienced. Um, the book itself has made history. Um, it, it is the best, uh, I mean, without Vonnegut's novel, it's hard to imagine that Dresden would have remained in, in cultural memory in so many different places. Uh, there, um, of course, a, a film made also on, on the novel, uh, based on the, on the novel. But at any rate, uh, to return to um, uh, the task that Hanushik sets himself, uh, and, and the one that then I therefore set myself, uh, basically he's suggesting that we need to look beyond uh, the usual suspects, uh, beyond, uh, in this case, uh, the, the initial uh, reports of the bombing, that is a by the bombers uh, for other voices, voices on the ground. And he suggests, one could almost say naively, that we need literature to do that. This is a picture um, that was taken uh, of, uh, not necessarily of the Dresden bombing, that I can't verify. I took it off the BBC's uh, website, uh, but it's very similar to the one that's actually reproduced in the book itself. Uh, and uh, the, Hanushik, the narrator, tells us, no, it's important to correct what the Pilot saw as something beautiful, as something successful, something, quote, that looks really good, quite good, I think is the quote. And that's what the task seems to be, uh, correcting the bomber uh, through additional eyewitness accounts, uh, through the use of literature, uh, answering the abstraction and distance of the photograph with the concreteness of, of those on the ground who suffered, gaining, as I say here, a fuller, richer, truer picture uh, you see, I'm asking questions, I'm about to qualify that, but there, one has to stay with that for a moment, that, that is all true. Uh, quoting Rushdie again, bringing home the news, uh, literature and other documentation is used precisely for that, uh, to those ends in that service and as a corrective to the abstract or the distant photography. So that's kind of all to the good. Uh, this is just uh, the cover of the first edition of Vonnegut's uh, novel that went into many editions and is still selling well. It is um, one of the so-called 100 best novels in modern library. Um, and uh, it has uh, gone on to make the Vonnegut estate a lot of money. This is the, uh, the front page, the uh, title page of the original edition. And I think it's worth uh, looking at some of the uh, what, what I, I would call this a Baroque Grimmel's housing and title page, you know, with, with uh, a, a long title and then a series of epithets and uh, attributes and claims under the, uh, um, the author's name. Uh, he says, among other things, if you, you let your eyes gaze down that list, a uh, prisoner of war who witnessed the fire bombing near Dresden, Germany, the Florence of the Alba a long time ago and lived to tell the tale much more to be said about that, but his description of Dresden as the Florence of the Elba is both true, as we'll find out, uh, or many of you will know already, but also insufficient. Um, of course, it was a great city of art, but, but it was indeed more. And uh, soon we'll be asking the question of why Vonnegut didn't know that or might not have, couldn't have known at the time and why didn't he find out in the meantime. But the original, um, effort, the original thrust uh, of the book uh, is, as I said, simply to take in more voices, to create this broader literary and documentary mosaic. Uh, and one of those voices that's mentioned briefly is, briefly in the, the book by Hanushek is Victor Klemperer. In Hanushek's small book, it's just a, a passing reference. Um, in my article, I took that as kind of a, a challenge to carry forth the mission of the Hanushek puts forth in this book. And so I fill out some of the gaps uh, and, and reread the diary entries of these uh, horrible evenings. I don't wanna say fateful, but horrible evenings. Um, and then the aftermath and what he and his wife experienced. For Klemperer, um, and this is a different experience, of course, than for Ida Kessner, this was a liberation. This was the moment that he was able to escape because of the bombing. And uh, Jewish friends of his, uh, as he says in the diary, uh, wished for this bombing prayed for this destruction. Uh, uh, even if it meant their own deaths, uh, they, they didn't want to live uh, any further uh, under the Nazi regime. So um, this is, you know, one visual again from the BBC of destroyed uh, Dresden. Um, and I'm going to show another one in just a second. We've seen them, perhaps we even habituated to them, uh, although they're still striking to me. This is one um, 
uh, where officials now are beginning to remove the bodies, um, it's conceivable, although if I look closely, probably not this one photograph, but uh, Kurt Vonnegut himself was one of the uh, soldiers, one of the prisoners of war who was conscripted into uh, cleaning up the bodies. Uh, so he would have done this kind of work. Now, why am I showing these pictures? Uh, well, uh, for one, to make it present to us, I think it's important to do that, but also uh, because I want to now highlight another thrust of the book. Uh, it opens up, as I said, with this kind of capacious welcome of multiple voices, and it sounds simply reasonable. Of course, one would do that, right? One wants to understand uh, this horrible event or series of events from multiple perspectives. But simultaneous with that, um, Hanushek is really uh, criticizing the sources or at least uh, very soberly assessing them. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, some of that, but I want to spend a little bit more time on that. Um, the promise of the book that we're gonna get something interesting from Ida is never fulfilled. It's, it's really um, disappointed. Um, and and the, the jacket cover text, uh, the so-called paratextual material uh, is, really misleading in that respect. Um, what Hanushek points out is uh, th that she has very little to say. Well, is that fair? She does say very little. Uh, she, she doesn't describe the, what we just saw in those pictures, the, uh, uh, the destruction, although she would have, have to, would have had to have seen much of that on her way to post the letters that we now have. Um, so, but interestingly, he doesn't leave it there. That too, I think would be mundane and something well known, but he asks us readers to think about what an absence of evidence can say about that perspective. Um, he asks us, for example, uh, sometimes just implicitly to wonder if this terseness, if, if this concealment, if you will, this avoidance is the act of a protective mother, is it, um, the act of a woman who has in fact perhaps assimilated some of the Nazi propaganda, um, who, uh, or perhaps the uh, mother who is afraid of endangering her son vis-a-vis -vis the Gestapo, um, who knows that her letters might be uh, being opened and read and, and doesn't want to expose herself to anything else. Um, and then of course, one can't forget uh, that she is very likely traumatized um, and being and suffering from what we would now call PTSD. Uh, something that I think contemporary reflection in literature has taken much more seriously. So uh, out of this silence, Hanushik creates a space for meaning. And I, I think that's, that's really interesting. Um, but the, the sober assessment or even critique uh, continues, uh, I think, courageously to Vonnegut. So what did Vonnegut get wrong? Well, he got a hell of a lot wrong. Um, <clears throat> Uh, he uh, was a POW, as I've mentioned several times, which means that you know, his status as a witness was extremely limited uh, and his language skills also limited him. Um, and so while he describes accurately uh, Dresden as being a great city of the arts, the Florence or the Elba, what he didn't seem to know is that there were troops in Dresden, that it was a major transfer point, what the Germans call it Dreikreuz for troops, that there were 130 weapons production facilities where forced laborers from Auschwitz, Flossenburg, and Theresienstadt worked every day and marched back and forth. Now, again, POWs aren't typically shown all these things, and I'm not saying that he would have, need, would have known it at the time. But what about in those decades after? Hanushik challenges him openly in the text, you know, posthumously, but openly, to say, uh, where, what, where was that research? Why, wasn't, why doesn't it show up? And then also, <clears throat> uh, Dresden, you know, one has to paint it in a fuller, with a fuller picture, and Hanushik goes there as well by recording the fact that two days after the horrific bombing, the trains to the east, to the camps, uh, the deportation trains in particular, started to roll again. And the Gestapo was not thrown into chaos. The persecution of the Jews picked up immediately after the bombings. Uh, so it's uh, the, the picture that Vonnegut gives us in this interesting, influential, powerful novel is significantly circumscribed and criticized um, in, in this little book, which I think has been overlooked uh, in the German press. Um, now, uh, so it's not just a matter of opening up uh, this echelot, opening up uh, our archive and including more voices. You see immediately that there's an intervention in a judgment. Um, and what I, I think lovely is really lovely. And then this refers back to the, the title of my talk, 
vermutlich die Wirklichkeit selbst. What Hanushek, the narrator, imagines is bringing his two principal informants, his two principal subjects together, Ida and Kurt. <clears throat> Now, there's no evidence that they actually met, um, but through his own research, uh, he's able to uh, conjure that they might have because POWs were actually pulled into service to help live low ladies cross the street and find their way uh, in the disorientation that ensued after the bombings. And we know from Ida's letters that she needed uh, to be uh, led around because she got lost and she fell. And then and in one point she records being lifted up by a soldier. So this imaginative meeting isn't necessarily uh, totally bonkers or fantasy, uh, but it's clearly more powerful as a metaphor for bringing really divergent uh, viewpoints together, um, uh, hosted, kind of curated in our minds at the same time, uh, a challenge uh, for complexity and, and uh, multi, multivalent perspectives. Um, so there's, uh, I guess, a, a twofold lesson. I'll try to pick up the pace here. Uh, use uh, literary evidence, but don't be naive about its limitations. Um, and we have uh, also a kind of a master archivist and, and a really <laughs> reliable, smart uh, Wissenschaftler at work here, uh, telling us the shortcomings of Vonnegut's novel, <clears throat> but at the same time, refusing to take on that role of objectivity and, 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 and truth. So, uh, What I'm getting at here is the uh, the rejection um, of this uh, uh, role of a academic authority in favor of a narrator who isn't necessarily the so-called unreliable narrator. I don't want to say that at all, but someone who is obviously situated in a particular place in time and has an agenda that isn't necessarily uh, one that upends any of his findings, but helps us understand that he too is one of us and, is, and has a limited perspective. So this brings us uh, into uh, kind of the central point, uh, um, the eruption of history into the present, um, uh, which is facilitated, or uh, as I've tried to stress, by the creation of uh, himself as a literary narrator with quirks, preoccupations, and mundane tendencies. Um, and this makes itself known through annoyances, at least to me. Uh, the, this really important story uh, about the bombing of Dresden is interrupted with the narrator's desire for a cup of coffee, for telling us how close he's getting on this train ride. Keep in mind that the subtitle of the book uh, is called Eine Zugfahrt, uh, which is going to be interesting, I think, in, in my argument, because it's all about how we approach Dresden, uh, metaphorically, not just you know, via train, and it's Zugfahrt. Um, and so, uh, you know, one can't help being pulled away from what seems most important and kind of a little annoyed about the egotism. He's on his way, he being Hanashek, the narrator, to a production uh, of a play that's based upon a book he had written. It's like, well, okay, congratulations, Hanashek. Uh, but uh, the, the function of this, I think, really is to stress the, uh, the vulnerability, the fallibility, the situatedness uh, of the narrator, which makes possible then uh, this whole awareness Uh, of how we move from present to the past, not just, you know, bingo, putting us jumping into the, to the past. All right, um, I think I can move on. Um, I, a lot of these points that you see in this slide, I think I've just covered uh, through my uh, discussion. Uh, yeah, I guess one thing I would press, uh, stress here is that while the historical commission uh, that did incredible detailed work and drew on a number of scholars and experts. While that remains important and valid in Hanushek's eyes, right, what the book is also telling us is that it's almost useless uh, in terms of a repository for cultural knowledge, the way that Rushdie imagined it, the way that Zebald imagined it. It's almost useless unless and until we can get, uh, act, we can find a way uh, to motivate access to that knowledge unless and until we can have a, a little piece of literature or film or some other aesthetic experience that will <clears throat> uh, body forth uh, a way of access that will, uh, that will show us how that uh, information actually is taken up into uh, cultural memory. There has, to, as I say at the final point here, to be interest, uh, curiosity, openness, and uptake. Um, I think these points are all uh, evident. I think the one thing on this slide I'd like to stress here is this quote. Um, this is very at the very beginning. It says page 10, but page 10 is actually the third printed page of the book. Uh, 
The narrator says, was weiß man heute schon von Dresden, vor allem wenn man in Süden Deutschlands lebt und von dort nur die Nachrichten hört, die politischer Natur sind, Neonazis, Pegide, AfD. Uh, that is, a, I think, an important quotation because it's, it's confessing from the beginning how this narrator is approaching Dresden. Uh, he is approaching it with this news in his ears, with these stories uh, of why it is important now. And one is never innocent of that present. Um, uh, and, and that will frame his concern and his interest throughout the book when he focuses, for example, on the refugees that are trapped in the train station in Dresden when the bombs drop, trapped because of the stubbornness, the lack of planning and the maliciousness on the part of the uh, Gestapo uh, and uh, the suicidal uh, policies about holding the, the Eastern territories until the very end when it was no longer even possible to hold them. So there are thousands of people being held there, hundreds die that night of suffocation. Um, and, and, and Hanushek is going to talk about that and, and relate that to refugees today and to the, the current plight of refugees in light of the uh, Syrian civil war in 2015 and 2016 and even up to the present, one, one can imagine. Um, that, that names for us the aperture, the, the approach, the Zugfahrt, if you will, that he's taking to, to, to the bombing. Uh, for him, it's going to be have a particular meaning, also because of his family history, coming from a family of expellees. Um, so what is being staged here or dramatized for us is the way in, in which our own family stories, our positionality, will always play an important role in whether and how we are, have an appetite for the story, uh, not, not just uh, as if the story exists in itself in some pure form. Uh, so that's, that's what I really mean here. I say contestable at the bottom, not because I think that he's saying anything uh, that is uh, to me personally objectionable, but it is contestable. I think the next slide actually illustrates that point. So let me move on. Uh, here I, I see Dresden in the eye of the beholder. Um, and I'm here, uh, where I wanted to list very quickly things that I think many participants and auditors will find familiar or know already. But these are various ways in which the memory of the horrible bombing of Dresden has been instrumentalized um, in, in very kind of crass and obvious and often ideological ways. Uh, let me just run through them first, and then I'm going to say a bit about how that relates to what I've just said about Hanushek. So the Nazis, as we know, immediately inflate the numbers 10 times to demonize the Allies. This you probably remember from grade school, although if you went to school in the GDR, you wouldn't know that because the GDR retains the inflated numbers throughout its 40-year uh, history for its Cold War purposes to stoke its anti-imperialist agenda, its identification of the Nazis with the, the then current Western allies, which is a bizarre, but uh, it was official doctrine, something I heard when I took my students uh, to visit uh, Dresden while it was still uh, in the GDR. David Irving then cites uh, these same inflated numbers along with other Holocaust deniers to uh, relativize the Holocaust, uh, basically to say, well, look at the Western allies did something horrible as well, therefore, dot, dot, dot. Vonnegut then cites Irving uh, out of naivete, who knows uh, if it's his narrative, but the point for Hanushik is that it's also very much in the context of a critique of, of the Vietnam War. And keep in mind, the book was published in 1969. Uh, the United States is involved uh, in bombing and uh, in the use of napalm which was first used in World War II, as, as we know. Um, and, and this becomes an argument in Vonnegut's story. There, there is no pure past. Everyone has an approach. Everyone has a tsukfat, right? And these are a list of other ones. Uh, and then I, I mentioned the American savior narrative, which is something that I uh, witnessed uh, personally. And I guess we all, any American would in some way, uh, I, I reflect on that in the article. And I won't have time to go into that now, but uh, you know, we tend to uh, aggrandize ourselves uh, in lots of provable ways, lots of demonstrable ways in the architecture, in our museums, in our national myth, et cetera. Um, but I, I won't go into that. But I, I will say that that certainly leads to a certain a limitation or minimalization of of the human suffering because one is so quick to say, oh, well, you know, it was necessary because, et cetera. I will go into the a British narrative. I'm not an expert on that. And I imagine there are many of you uh, who are, so I'll leave that as a question. Uh, but I guess the last point here would be this, um, just because Hanushek is positioning himself as a narrator with a particular agenda, 
does not mean uh, in this book, and certainly not in my reading, that he's equating all views as equally valid or invalid. Uh, not the case at all. Uh, it's simply, I think, a gesture of humility uh, and honesty, candor to, to say that, yes, you know, we are not above it, we are a part of it, uh, but that doesn't eliminate the possibility to say there are better and worse versions of the story. Um, that, that may want to be debated, uh, but that I want to hold fast onto that, at least for now. <clears throat> this um, is really a slide I had planned to show earlier, so I think we can move right on. Uh, again, just coming back to that fundamental distinction between the what and, and the how. Now, um, I, I want to spend the last maybe 15 minutes or so on the uh, on film. Um, I, I originally conceived of this as a kind of I personally had to go back and reread Sebald and try to figure out what was going on there. Uh, I'm going to simply assert some things, and if it's interest to uh, anyone in, who's listening, we can go back and talk about it more during Q&A. But I would say that the, the Sebald thesis has largely been debunked, um, uh, at least in, as it's narrowly construed, uh, but the discussion that he launched uh, was worthwhile and influential. I want to name two scholars that I particularly value here, Peter Fritsche and I mentioned Susanna V. Scolani already. I think they're both fantastic. For those of you teaching this, I would especially recommend V. Scolani's article because it's concise and she um, distills an argument that she makes at uh, greater length in an entire monograph on this topic. Um, but anyway, what, what insights uh, do these thinkers bring to this? Uh, well, they say, you know, they concede, for example, that no, the air raid bombings uh, by the Allied powers were not never a dominant motif in post-war discourse, neither were they a major uh, trend in, in post-war literature, but they were there. They were there much more than uh, Sebald uh, was willing to acknowledge. But I think more interesting is V. Scolani's point that shame, the role that shame, guilt, and trauma played um, in uh, perhaps limiting some of those expressions. The, the, the role that uh, shame, guilt, and trauma may have played in uh, uh, our understanding of Ida Kessner, for example. Why is she so closed mouth, mouthed about this whole thing? Well, they're, they're, these are possible uh, explanations. But interesting now for our transition to film is her point, uh, also one that appears again and again in the recent literature on trauma, is that it is, quote, usually stored as a visual image, which I take as a key to, to look to film, which I'm going to do, do right now. Um, I think we can move right on then. Uh, and here I, I simply want to say something that I think is also broadly understood, but uh, maybe bears a, a quick mention. And that is that um, if, even if uh, we want to grant Sebald uh, uh, some, some truth, maybe, maybe you know, I don't, don't think there was ever a real taboo uh, for the, if we're going to limit it to literature, it was never true of film. And I think it was always wrong uh, to limit ourselves or the, our purview to German productions, whether that be film or literature, one has to look at what was being consumed and read. Um, and when we think of cinema, which is where I wanna take the discussion now, we know that the vast majority of cinema was uh, American cinema, uh, certainly not homegrown cinema. Uh, and so to pretend that that is the national cinema that counts, that's the one that funds and stokes national identity is mistaken, fundamentally mistaken. I'm giving you just four quick examples. You could easily extend this list, but from the very beginning, think of the GDR film, the DEFA film, Die Mörder sind unter uns. Uh, does that feature actual bombing? No, but it features the results of the bombing, which, you know, metonymically, synecdochally, uh, clearly communicate the bombing and the destruction. And we have those scenes over and over again. Billy Wilder's Foreign Affair in 1948, um, and I jumped 30 years inexcusably, but I wanted to make it quick. Uh, you know, why was it Fassbinder, uh, his, the Eadamea Maria Brown, why was it so well received by conservatives in Bavaria and elsewhere in Germany? It's because it showed Germany as a victim and suffering and particularly begins with the air raids. So I just simply want to kind of remove this whole idea that it wasn't there. Of course it was there, it's still with us now. I just watched the defeated um, and uh, one cannot miss the evidence of the bombings immediately. Um, it's, uh, it, it's hiding out in the open if it's hiding at all. All right, uh, there's more to be said here, but I really do want to get to uh, uh, Michiat Clear, so I'll, I'll jump over this. I'd love to come back to this uh, detective fiction being a freer genre, but uh, I'm gonna sacrifice that point in the interest of time. Uh, in the remaining uh, time now, I wanna really focus on Michiat Clear's Dresden Trilogy. Um, and uh, 
as I said, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the last one and then more time on the first one and skip entirely the second uh, film. And I'm sorry about that, but uh, I'm not, again, I'm happy to talk about it. The last film uh, is called Film Tagebuch or Film Diary. And it's very much um, Clear's um, sp speaking in his own voice. Uh, narratologists rightly you know, want us to differentiate between the filmmaker and and the, the narrator or the author and the narrator, that's all fine and good, but he goes to extra lengths to, to identify with this narrator. Uh, and that's important because the film uh, is, uh, refers to key moments in his life that explain why uh, and how the memory of the bombing of Dresden was suppressed and why, what he wants to do about that. Let me just uh, jump ahead to uh, uh, the next slide and then I'll come back to this one. This, the film um, opens not quite with this picture. It opens first with clear filming with a, 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 a camera through the window of the Straßenbahn, through the streetcar, looking at modern day, which is 2013, of the year the film was made, Dresden. Um, and it takes, it's important to mention that because this is the, the terrain that he's traversing that I've been talking about through the entire talk of going from the present to the past and how does one get there? He literally takes us from the present, filming it through the Strassenbahn window to this picture and he dwells on it for quite a while that the camera goes up and down this still. Uh, and then we see two more stills. Um, and in the course of this meditation, this memory, this visual uh, recollection of the bombing, he makes the following points. He says, uh, he, first he claims that there was no Spiel film ever made in the ruins. He takes that back later in the film, it's kind of astounding, but uh, it's, nevertheless, this point is actually one in partial agreement with Zabal, saying that, you know, we really did avoid this. We should have been focusing more on it. And then he offers an explanation as to why it was avoided. Uh, and here has, one has to keep in mind his positionality. He was born in 1943. Uh, he's roughly then, you could say, in the second generation. And he says that the avoidance came about because the parents, and he means, you know, for those who were adults during the war, uh, had an unacknowledged complicity in the destruction. Now that's quite interesting because that's very much at odds with official GDR doctrine, uh, which did not uh, acknowledge any complicity in the, the destruction, but blamed it entirely on the fascist Western powers. He then uh, goes on to interpret the ruins that he's shown us very dramatically here as traces of a, of a collapsed uh, empire, Spuren eines untergangenen Reiches. Uh, again, that's interesting because, uh, you know, Dresden was a city maintained, if you will, as a war memorial throughout the GDR period, not entirely by choice. There, there wasn't enough money to restore it, uh, but uh, it was an argument of convenience, perhaps, to say that, no, this is all intended. Uh, it's kind of like uh, the, the church in West Berlin, uh, the, the Kaiser Wilhelm Gedächtniskirche, except extend that to the whole city. Um, so the GDR doctrine is at odds with this criticism, with, with this view, this interpretation, uh, but it's his. And uh, then he goes on to propagate a conspiracy theory uh, as to why the lovely, wealthy, rich uh, area uh, across the river has been preserved entirely. He suggests that the bourgeoisie was there before the war and somehow retained their power all through the GDR. It's kind of stretching. Uh, uh, believability on, on that point, but nevertheless, an important point. And then he concludes the film by mounting an anti-capitalist critique regarding the development uh, along the Elba. He suggests and warns that this lovely area that is now being used by the people, das Volk, uh, will soon be bought up and divided up and, and developed by uh, developers uh, with luxury apartments. Uh, he's got uh, an equally strong uh, critique of the GDR uh, as well as the West, um, uh, Western capitalism. So I don't want to suggest that it's just one side. Um, I, I, I explain all this simply to say that um, this is a film that is strongly uh, inflected by argument. Uh, it's expository, it's interpretive. Uh, uh, he's showing his images, but taking us right into you know, what he thinks they all mean. This stands in contrast uh, to, whoops, the, the last film, uh, the next film and the last point in the lecture, so we are coming to the end, uh, that I wanna talk about through a series of stills. I'm not gonna show a clip, uh, Frank, because this film doesn't live on YouTube and it's not easy, easy to cite that way. But I think in chopping it up this way, I'm, I, it also lets us focus on, on the visual moments. So Kurztrip, which is the first of the Dresden trilogy, is um, 
in many ways, uh, the exact opposite of the film we just discussed. It's not a conceptual expository argument. It's suggestive. It's more existential. It has a lot of mystery to it. It has um, a, a plot with gaps lashed at and one doesn't even know really everything that's going on. Um, and so what I call it in my little title here is the Dresden Trilogy, uh, tr trilogy number one, Engaging the Past, Vergangenheits Anerkennung. Uh, I'm using that as a in contrast to Bewältigung or Aufarbeitung. Uh, the goal of this film is not to narrowly in, ac accuse or interpret uh, or explain why the parent generation failed or suppressed it's something. It, it's much more general, but I think also more fundamental to say, hey, you must have to first acknowledge a connection to the past. And that's really all it wants to do. So what I love about this thing is you see this young couple who are the subjects of this film, and it's literally an uphill effort, if not battled, for them to get to that perch, that, that point uh, in the, uh, that beautiful neighborhood I just described. Um, it's called Ambeisenhirsch, uh, to look down on the Elbe Valley uh, and to see uh, what the, the, the old city and what was then the destruction. We'll, we'll get to that now in just a moment. This is just another scene to kind of emphasizing the effort it takes. They have to push their bikes. It's, it's so steep. Um, I, I think it's a lovely image of, a, uh, of try, a way of expressing that turning to these difficult paths is, is not something one does lightly necessarily. And it doesn't have to be uh, a conscious or ideological rejection. It's just that it's often a real effort. <clears throat> uh, the couple for undisclosed reasons is having a spat, a lover's quarrel. The guy doesn't want to do this. Uh, he never says why. It's not that he's a crypto AFD uh, member or anything like that. He's, he'd just rather be down by the river sunning himself and probably, uh, you know, uh, making out with his girlfriend. Uh, that's pretty much what he says, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, life gets in the way. And at this point, he says, you know what, forget it. I'm leaving. And he does. And he abandons her. Um, and it looks like we're simply witnessing some some love story gone wrong here. Uh, he goes off to his own to try to recover apparently, um, but he doesn't go all the way down. He stays, you can see that he's still uh, at, a, at a lookout that's gonna play an important role in the next few minutes of the film. Um, in a sense, waiting for her uh, to show up, which she does. They resolve their dispute. There's some love play that goes on, a lot of physical interaction. That's actually quite charming. And it's important to say though, because it's, uh, they're, they're visually beautiful actors. Um, and, and I think that's part of Cleo's message, you know, that the, the seduction of the present, both in their lives and for us as viewers, right, can interfere with an invitation to view something, uh, a horrific atrocity from the past. Why would one do that? Why would you pry yourself away from watching beautiful people reconcile and, and be happy? <clears throat> uh, this moves now to the climax of the film where um, at that very lookout where we see them, uh, him sunning himself, uh, the woman begins to read visually and tactily as if it's braille, the inscriptions along the, uh, the that are uh, in the stone itself. Now here it's important to remember briefly that as they're walking up the hill, when they're pushing their bikes, she's reading from the guidebook. And from the guidebook, she reads the, the, the claim that this area was spared because of the bourgeoisie that were ensconced there and that somehow an American spy sent a signal to the planes and, and directed them elsewhere. But when she says it, there's a moment of irony, you know, in, in this sense, irony that she's kind of wondering if it's true. She's not proclaiming it with the authority of Michael Clear. Uh, it is, in my, uh, for my money, uh, much more aesthetically valuable uh, or uh, acceptable because I, I'm not, there's no, I'm not asked to accept it. It's simply throwing it out. But what it does for this scene is it reminds us that this whole area uh, uh, it pre exists, if you will, it, it's not been destroyed by the war. And so these inscriptions hail from the pre-war period, probably extend into the present. And what we're seeing are dates. You can see a 45 if you look closely, uh, but what you see most prominently are hearts, declarations of love, romance, uh, initials, uh, just the kinds of things one would see probably uh, all over the world. Uh, this, there's a lot made of this. She then looks at this obelisk, if that's what it is. Uh, it closely examines inscriptions there also with her hand. And notice what she does here. She moves that hand, literally transferring the knowledge, if you will, that she's gained from those inscriptions 
uh, to the chest uh, of her boyfriend. I'm, I'm moving along here. Somehow wins him over his care, awakens in him a curiosity uh, born, I would suggest, of love. Um, uh, and then she pulls out the picture she's always had with her, the reason she came uh, and wanted to bring him up here. Uh, this is the picture of uh, Dresden after the bombing. And she's at the precise place where the picture was taken. And she says to him, um, it wasn't that long ago. Uh, the film slows down here. There's a lot of attention to this, of her actually really situating the picture into the present of the, the experience. She makes a very a point of showing it to him. He takes it in his hand. And this is, uh, I think, quite interesting. This isn't my word. This is a quote from the film. She says to him, ta-da. Uh, in other words, this is why we did this. This is why we came here. Um, it, it was a, important. And then she places him in the frame. So she has placed history in the present, placed the picture into the frame of the present, and then put him in it. And he's obviously willingly there. Um, and then the film ends uh, very abruptly uh, but with his sense of release. Uh, there's no peddling, there's no effort, there's no sweating, it's over. Uh, so I spent a lot of time describing a film. I'm sorry if, uh, if that's not as interesting as seeing it, it certainly isn't, but I hope I at least have motivated you to watch it. But here's what I wanna conclude, and then I will be done and ready for the Q&A. What is the contribution here? Um, I would say that, you know, um, maybe stating the obvious, but one has to feel connected to the past prior to interpreting it. If Erinnerungskultur, if memory culture is primarily driven by duty, responsibility, or expectations, particularly of somebody else, of a foreigner, uh, uh, it, it cannot be authentic. Um, I think it's also interesting to notice that in the first film, which was chronologically his last, a film talk, a book, film diary. Uh, Clear is speaking of himself, of a man who's now almost 80 years old, born in 1943. In this film that we just looked at, it's another younger generation, more distant from the bombing. A different argument has to be made, I'm suggesting, for this younger group. They first have to feel a bond. They have to look out and say, you know, like the woman does, that wasn't that long ago. Those lovers that I just traced with my hand, they're you, they're me, we are these people. She's not thinking of them first as Nazis, not thinking of them first as victims. She's thinking of them as people who made promises of love to each other and made silly hearts and arrows and inscribed their dedication to each other for eternity. Uh, and then perhaps were burnt to a crisp, at least some of them. Um, that identification, that, that fundamental saying, we are they, they are we, is prior to everything else. And I think that it's captured to me quite beautifully in, in this film. The other thing I think the film achieves, and I think it's really, really important, is it doesn't demonize those who are hesitant to engage the past. It gives lots of, you know, acceptable reasons. This guy is, you know, maybe a bit of a hedonist or lazy or just normal, I don't know how to, how to put it, uh, but he isn't uh, necessarily politically suspect trying to uh, evade, uh, you know, the necessary uh, protocols of Vergangenheitsbewältigung. He's made very plausible, at least in my mind. Um, the so here's I the third point down, the claims of the sensual present, lounging on the riverbank with your lover might explain a hesit hesitancy to engage the, the past. At one point he confesses, you know, when he's mad at her, I'd rather be home doing, you know, renovating my apartment. Uh, one has to acknowledge that, right? And not look or treat to a memory culture uh, as if it exists in isolation. And, and this is, I argue elsewhere, is I think the beauty of the uh, Stolpersteine, because they can be, uh, ignored or uh, attended to according to the needs of the moment, according to the possibilities of the moment. So I conclude by saying Kurt's trip doesn't tell us precisely what to make of February 1945, but it does seem to insist that it is still part of us. And in that, you know, it could lead to interpretation, the kind of heavy handed interpretation we get in film diary, or maybe not, maybe simply uh, a way of keeping it alive. My final reflection is, uh, would I have said all this if I were a German? <laughs> you know, a big point that I made with Hanushik's book and, and with the clear films is that they're, they're really dramatizing or thematizing um, our turn to the past from the present. How do we get there to begin with? 
And if I'm looking at my own situation, as I, I claim is so important for this Hanushek narrator, then, then what's you know, freeing me from, um, f- from the, the shackles or the, the, uh, the duties uh, of uh, Vergangen Heisbewältigung? It might be that I'm an American uh, and that I don't see it the same way. Uh, and there, or that I look at my young students and I, I think that you know, they have to be first connected to this past in some way before they can care about it. I'm trying now to simply account for my own preference for this uh, approach that's taken in Kurt's trip, this, this uh, film from Clear. And, and then I, I guess as an American, uh, and I know this is a radical shift, but maybe, maybe it's also a, a logical shift if we're gonna think about positionality. We are celebrating in this country uh, what we, so we call for better or worse Black History Month. And the point has recently been made in the media, and I think it's a very good one, you know, that slavery isn't black history. Slavery is our history. Slavery is everybody's history. Um, and, and I think that is the exact point. That's, that's the first hurdle that needs to be overcome. If you don't identify and see that past as yours, if you don't see those people as yours, if you don't, as that young woman does, you know, touch the past and touch the present and somehow bring them together, put them in the same frame. If we cannot do that, right? The rest is probably not going to matter much. We have a brand new museum in Washington, the the Museum of the History and Culture of African Americans. It opened up almost 30 years after the Holocaust Museum in this country, and we could talk about why that is the case, right? But the Holocaust has become a national narrative in certain ways, right? But the Black History Museum or the Black Culture Museum, um, it's really both, um, is sometimes I think and I fear being treated as a kind of a ghettoized thing, like my people. Like, and, and, and so this is the connection I'm trying to make and take, if, if you will, the, the lesson that I'm trying to impart, I'm trying to take it to heart, looking at my own sukfart, my own approach, not only to Dresden, but to all kinds of uh, very, very difficult uh, past histories. So that's, I'm ending with that somewhat moralizing uh, exhortation to look at your own sukhfat. Uh, I hope that's, uh, that's not too heavy handed. Thank you very much for your time. Well, thank you very much indeed for uh, this uh, highly uh, informative and very measured and very clear talk. I think uh, one couldn't uh, have a more controversial topic, I dare say, um, than this one. And um, you have presented us with uh, a whole raft of um, very, I dare say, existential questions. Um, and um, one aspect I think that you've highlighted so um, so well is that uh, Innerungskultur or perhaps uh, Innerungsarbeit must not be seen in isolation. I think this is something which we will t- certainly uh, take away from this, uh, from this uh, remarkable talk. It would be very tempting to ask you where you feel that uh, Telkam's the term sits in all of this, but uh, I won't do that um, because that's probably a different talk. Um, but then we have, of course, an author who has shifted and um, pushed himself, as it were, into a distinctly problematic uh, right wing corner. But um, um, I dare say what you also told us about uh, Vonnegut's um, problematic approach makes one wonder whether a re-edition of Vonnegut uh, in a kind of critical format is not overdue or has this already happened? I asked out of total ignorance. That's, uh, that's very interesting. Uh, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just reading Noah with my students. Uh, right. it, and at the end, you know, there's a little apparat there's, uh, that puts in uh, historical perspective of the story that we've just read, I can well imagine that something like that or more would be necessary. I frankly don't know if there is an addition with these corrections uh, out there, mm. but that would seem to be necessary. Yeah, indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, the floor is open. Um, I will just call up the chat and see what has happened. Uh, there is a comment from Suzanne Noel. Um, your penultimate slide reminds me of the famous phrase from William Faulkner, the past is never dead, it's not even past. So I think that's a very uh, important comment indeed. And um, I, th- I suppose we can subscribe to that, can't we? Yes, yeah. And what you said earlier interests me also. I'm, I'm just reminded that I first read Vonnegut in college in a course on World War II that was given by a military historian at the University of Michigan. Um, and uh, so the military historian presumably 
would have known or might have known uh, enough to contextualize the novel, it, but, but it wasn't uh, contextualized. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm a bit behind in my thinking here. I'm still thinking uh, of the other question, but I like the remark uh, about Faulkner as well, yes. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, yeah, any further, or rather any questions? Any questions, thoughts, reflections, comments, please? I mean, you mentioned the British narrative yeah. as a um, compliment, as it were. Um, the British narrative, to my recollection, uh, somehow started again when the um, Bomber Harris monument was unveiled by uh, the uh, then Queen Mother. And uh, that triggered an extraordinary avalanche of discussion in this country. Uh, A, was this monument necessary? Um, and what does it really signify? And I think there was um, indeed some form of, um, shall we say, new form of the British narrative on the subject of, of Dresden. But um, we have, I'm sure, other attendees who would like to, to comment on, on, on these issues. I, I would love to extend the discussion to Hamburg as well, if anyone's interested in doing that. Um, yeah. I visited uh, Hamburg with a group of scholars in 1996 that was funded by the Fulbright um, mm -hmm. Foundation or the Fulbright Group. And it was really a remarkable group. And uh, as I said, they were not just scholars, most were historians. And, uh, you know, we got to that famous counter monument there that is, is it was erected as kind of an answer to or contextualization mm -hmm. of the uh, Nazi era monument that kind of celebrates uh, martial aspirations and particularly has Nazi uh, stuff in it. And the counter monument originally appeared to most people in the group as if it were commemorating the camps. Uh, they, mm -hmm. The first thing that came to mind was not the firebombing at Hamburg. Um, and I know one has to be methodolo methodologically very careful about asserting what is public memory because there are certain mm. groups that are much better informed and certain pockets and subgroups, et cetera. But it, I think it is an interesting that a, a well-informed group could make that mistake. Um, and I do wonder, you know, get, you know, about what the motivations would have been either by the Western allies, by Britain, by the United States, or by West Germany to preserve the memory of the bombing. Uh, you know, there was a real political motivation in Dresden, and, and Vonnegut helped that quite a bit. Uh, uh, historians, you know, credit him for good and ill for keeping the memory alive, uh, but not, that did not exist for Hamburg. Uh, I mean, I know later on we have uh, uh, the Jörg, uh, who, who I forget his last name, who wrote Brandt, uh, you know, in the wake of oh, yes. the Yes. Uh, so that all comes much later, but I'm wondering about the Cold War period. Uh, mm -hmm. Anyway, I'm just tossing out things <laughs> to try a, a, a tone for not having covered Hamburg. <clears throat> yes, indeed. I think uh, the Hamburg case is, is indeed a, a rather, a rather tricky one in so many ways. And I mean, things that happened in Hamburg, also in terms of the resistance of young people against uh, the regime, against Hitler, uh, is often forgotten. I mean, we all talk about the Christa Scholl, but we rarely talk about this extraordinary um, groundswell of young resistance people in Hamburg uh, after 43, for example. So, you know, there's a whole complex that needs to be revisited in many ways. But since you mentioned also uh, Vonnegut's um, reference to David Irving, it's extraordinary, but uh, the Irving trial, for example, um, where one of the, um, the key specialists who um, <clears throat> um, were called upon by, um, by the prosecutor, namely uh, Gerald Fleming. Mm, uh, he, at the time, he made the point that uh, so much that um, Irving said about Dresden is simply untenable. Mm -hmm. And uh, he could evidence it then during the trial. I mean, that I think is also remarkable. Hence, even more surprising that um, Wonnegut keeps being distributed in this um, rather innocent form. But anyway, we have, um, one point here. Yeah, Elsie, um, is there any difference in the way Hamburg and Dresden remembered the bombings in the immediate years following the end of the war, considering Dresden was a part of the GDR and Hamburg was not? So, well, I mean, here I, I'm sure I would be echoing what many of us uh, know already, but so the, the GDR was motivated to 
suck the narrative into their own founding myth of uh, communist anti-fascist resistance fighters. But in so doing, you know, it was both uh, historical and anti-historical. On, on the one hand, it was a way of uh, acknowledging the, the Nazi villainy. On the other hand, it was kind of a way of extending that to the then current situation uh, of the allies and making it a crime uh, perpetrated uh, in some way, you know, in the present. I know that sounds bizarre to say it that way, uh, but we, when I, I tell the story in that article that you were kind enough to read, uh, you know, we were berated uh, as if it was an ongoing crime. And, and there was a certain logic to that because the city still lay in ruins in 1988, at least much of it, the downtown area. And it was really quite depressing. Uh, so there was this bizarre, you know, acknowledgement of history, and then also the a, a D or non-historical way of extending it uh, into the present. I think, you know, there's uh, one should also say there is there is a truth to this. There's a good side to it. Yes, it was ideology. Yes, it was official state doctrine. Uh, but I think it was the first time. Um, well, I shouldn't say the first time because Vonnegut has to be credited with that, but having uh, this guide stare us in the face and tell us uh, you know, that America has committed a war crime uh, and then seeing that or experiencing that in the presence of my students uh, it was a powerful emotional experience. And I think we also have to get away from the, the fact that this is all cognitive or conceptual. There's also a huge emotional moment uh, to this. Um, and, and I think the GDR has to be credited with that, even if, uh, one can say there were other reasons. Uh, there were, you know, that they, maybe some of this happened coincidentally because they couldn't afford to renovate it anyway. But there was a lot of good, I think, that has to be acknowledged um, in remembering Dresden uh, in, throughout the GDR years. And with Hamburg, you would say there is a market difference, isn't there? Uh, yeah, I, and here I, I, I'm out of my area. I don't want to uh, speculate too greatly, but. I feel uh, that it has been erased, uh, but in, in a way that's similar to so many of the cities in Germany. You know, there's this, all this attention now to re rebuilding the palace, at least partially in, in Berlin, and the whole debate about, you know, the historicity and, 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 and all that business. And, and I, I'm astounded really by the, the duty that so many Germans feel from many different social classes to go and take a stand on it. You know, mm -hmm. they've read about it, uh, and talking about people uh, who are workers, middle brow people, they, they, they they think of it as important. But what I do as an American, I kind of step back and say, well, haven't you done that to a lot of your cities anyway? <laughs> I mean, the, the whole rebuilding expunges uh, the, the truth of the, 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 of the devastation. And I think it's almost inevitable. But other than that, I don't have a great insight. Thank you. Right, we have a, a comment by Paul Stalker, um, a fellow trustee of the Dresden Trust, incidentally, uh, who runs a very successful a scheme for um, school people, for school pupils, uh, to visit um, to visit Dresden uh, on a regular basis. And uh, this scheme really is quite something and pretty much unique in this country. Now he says, I wonder. If literature and film about Dresden and elsewhere is mostly fairly indirect, is not at least um, that for all involved, bomber and citizen alike, was so traumatic that uh, there was, as Sebald suggests, simply no words adequate to the challenge of describing it, apart from almost meaningless phrases. It was hell down there. I've never seen anything like it. So the question is, the adequacy of language, um, you know, one was somehow lost for words. I mean, you alluded to this, but perhaps yeah, yeah. you would no, I, I like think, to comment. I think it's a great insight and I, I think it deserves to be underscored and, and really sat with and lived with. And I think that's one of the accomplishments. Uh, you know, Hanushek takes us down these uh, dead ends or he'll suggest <clears throat> something that then turns out to be interestingly not the case. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I tried to communicate. And I think this, um, uh, overlaps or coincides with the point that Paul is making that uh, silences can be profound and mm. can be eloquent. And that's why he wants to hold up these, these mm. postcards, which, you know, if you simply judge them on the basis of their content and of their scope, you would be dismissive of them, mm. uh, but he won't do that. Uh, and, and so they become, you know, a testament or a testimony uh, to that which cannot be said, at least mm. at the time. And they become meaningful in that larger context when you put them in the context of other speakers. Uh, 
And I love the way he imagines her being meeting the American, the POW, because in a way it improves both informants, mm -hmm. if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. uh, um, by us imagining these things, things coming together, he's challenging us to be uh, generous intellectually and emotionally um, to not just uh, follow out that which already uh, interested us about this tragedy, but to see, to see the ways in which others have experienced it. So I'm going to come back to Paul's point about uh, the trauma, you know, sealing people's mouths or, or keeping them from writing about it. I think that is powerful, but also, you know, that we have indirect but still fairly clear references. It didn't always have to be the bombing of Dresden or of Hamburg, but to, to show people again and again bombing per se or the results of bombing, I think did allow them to uh, have an, a public acknowledgement, a cultural acknowledgement of their suffering. And I think that can be judged a good thing. It doesn't have to be immediately put into the category of, oh, this is self-pity. This is a way of not acknowledging responsibility for starting the war. Um, I, I just don't think that's true. Now, admittedly, that's perhaps a freedom that an American has, but uh, that's, that's my conviction. I mean, at the same time, one has to say that um, Victor Klemperer, whom you quoted, and I think this was very important that you stressed Klemperer, um, because Hanushek really doesn't make much of him, which is somewhat surprising. Yeah. Um, but um, Klemperer, as a philologist, as a Romanist, uh, he had the words for it, but different words. And I think it just shows that even, even this traumatic situation in Dresden is ultimately a question of perspective when you write about it, when you talk about it, when you right. try to find the words for it. Um, uh, because Klemperer uh, really, I think, is a key witness in all of this. Yeah, um, I, Klemperer, is, as you say, um, really important. And he did write about it immediately. He yeah. consigned it to his diaries. But in some cases, the hesitancy wasn't on the part of the person who experienced it or tried to write about it, but on the part of uh, those who would circulate it in, in wider culture, or, or mm -hmm. in some cases, you know, the books that uh, Zebald ignored, it, it, there are two I want to let him off the hook a little bit, because sometimes they just weren't read and didn't sell. So it may also be to extend Paul's point that the audience wasn't ready to confront it that directly. Um, I, I think these indirect uh, confrontations uh, with, with these visuals of destruction, I think might have uh, sufficed. Um, but I wanted to come back, if I may, if we have just a second to this question of, of perspective. One thing that kind of haunts me is, uh, you know, I'm a, I went to grad school in the 90s uh, with a high deconstruction and extreme skepticism. And that was often sold to us as kind of the height of intellectual achievement is to learn to distrust everything, to learn to, you know, that language, you know, with Derrida and others uh, ultimately must fail. It cannot communicate, you know, that's the real truth. Um, and I just uh, want to be careful not to uh, argue that Hanushek is going in this direction, nor am I. Uh, I think one can acknowledge um, with humility, perspectivism, without saying that therefore there is no objective truth. And I, it, I don't know if I'll have opponents out there who wanted to argue that point with me, but uh, I think that's important to hold on to. Mm, indeed, indeed. I mean, one thing that um, probably is can be said in, ex, in apology to, uh, shall we say, Seabald's approach, um, he was surprised at the extent of the echo he had uh, for this um, text, which originally was a lecture he gave in Zurich. Yes. And it was then extended, expanded very quickly. And um, I'm afraid that Hansa Verlag is not completely innocent um, in the way in which this whole thing was blown up. Um, this was not necessarily Sebald's original intention. Um, but that's a different matter. He, he was absolutely frank about the fact that he had not done exhaustive research on this. Mm -hmm. And it got, these are his words, um, or rather were his words, that it got out of hand. Yeah. It got out of hand in terms of the sensationalism that was created after this lecture was given in, in Zurich. Um, but the other thing is, of course, and Zewald does not say this, uh, which I think is a bit, uh, is also a bit problematic, uh, in the West, and when we when we ask about Hamburg, the difference between remembering Hamburg and remembering Dresden, let's not forget that um, in the Federal Republic of Germany, um, after 49, 
those um, air raids on Western German cities, they were committed by friends. Suddenly they were all friends. Mm -hmm. And that is a difference. That is a huge Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so there great. was in that sense no memory culture, uh, at least officially, uh, yeah. it wasn't present. It wasn't there. No, I, I'm glad you made that uh, so explicit. Uh, Absolutely, that has to be that has to be stressed. And at the same time, the kind of Anerkennungskultur that you refer to, and I think this is extremely important. Uh, Thomas Mann famously, in, in one of his uh, BBC broadcasts, uh, when he commented on the destruction, the air raid on Lübeck, uh, he interestingly said, he said, I've heard about this. And he says this, of course, in California, where it's recorded. Great. I've heard about Lübeck. I've heard about the destruction of where I come from. But I have only to say, think of Coventry, and that's the only comment I have on the subject, which I think it was an extraordinary, an extraordinary phrase, an extraordinary comment that he made. It is. Uh, and then when he went to Lübeck, though, when he went to visit Germany after the war, yeah. uh, he then revised it again. Uh, yes. He said, you know, it, now it means something else being here. Yes. Uh, yes. So to, to be so quick to reduce it to, OK, well, that's the revenge and one has to yeah. put in the context. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But there, there is that other aspect. Yeah. You know, there's this new, fairly new book out, Colm Teuben, I think is the author, but I called The Magician. Uh, and uh, I don't know exactly what it adds to our under understanding of Thomas Mann, but uh, it certainly is a testament to his ongoing attraction and appeal. I couldn't cool. put it down, but I couldn't tell you what the real contribution is. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> Fine. Are there any further questions or comments, ladies and gentlemen? Well, if this is not the case, well, I can only, on behalf of all of us, thank you very, very much. Thank you most warmly um, for this uh, really remarkable uh, lecture. And um, I very much hope that we can read uh, what you have presented us with, perhaps at some stage in our yearbook on Germion, which would be lovely to have. Fine. That would be wonderful. Let thank me you thank you, so the, uh, and let me thank you all, uh, all the sponsors, the Dresden Trust, uh, the BASF, and, and everyone who made this possible, uh, all the people who coordinated it, Rochelle and Kim, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Thank you all very much, and also all of you for attending, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.